I hope you're already comfortable with the first law. So, the second law of thermodynamics is generally considered to be a very sophisticated principle and it is generally considered to be a symbol of scientific literacy. For example, if you are fond of Urdu literature, you will not be considered a master of Urdu literature without having studied Diwan e Ghalib. Or if you are fond of Persian literature, you won't be able to understand or be considered a master if you haven't studied Diwan e Hafiz. Likewise, in the field of science in general and engineering, the second law of thermodynamics is considered to be a mark of scientific literacy. If you understand the second law and you are able to present it in a succinct way, in a way that is clear, that is crisp, that is accurate, then it would mean you are scientifically literate. And there is a lot of confusion regarding the second law of thermodynamics because it is a very subtle and a very sophisticated scientific principle. So, up till so far, we've looked at the first law of thermodynamics, which is basically the law of conservation of energy. We've also talked about the quantization of uh, energy levels. Uh, and based upon the things that we've learned, I would like to uh, make a case for the second law of thermodynamics. But first of all, I would like to show you uh, a video that I hope it works. It's just a ball that is bouncing off the floor. It's nothing very special about it. So you drop a ball and it starts jumping on the floor. Alright, let me play this again. There's nothing special about it. <laughs> All right, so in this process, could you tell me if the first law of thermodynamics is sa satisfied? Yes. 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 How? Anyone, please raise hands. How is the first law of thermodynamics satisfied? Yes, please. What do you mean energy is, after my first week of lectures, you shouldn't say energy is lost in the form of heat. The kinetic, when the ball falls onto the ground, it transfers its energy through random microscopic collisions to the ground, which raises the thermal energy of the ground and it raises the internal energy of the solid. Don't say it loses energy as heat, all right? And then, so in the bouncing process and with the residual energy, it manages to go against the uh, potential, against the potential gradient, against the force of gravity, rise to a certain height and then fall again. So the first law of thermodynamics is actually being fully satisfied in this case. All right, so there is no violation of the energy principle. But let me show you another video. All right, so look at this video. All right. Looks funny because it defies our common sense. It defies our intuition. Let me play it once, once more. Yeah, I wanted you to laugh on this because this is really funny. It, it defies our common sense. But the question is, is the first law of thermodynamics violated if such a process were to take place? Why? Right, so the ground has a large number of 
molecules and those molecules have disordered motion when the ball hits the ground it is possible that some of the disordered motion some of the thermal energy is converted to orderly motion of of the ball of the table tennis ball and that disordered motion can possibly do some work some mechanical macroscopic work so that the height of the ball goes up and when the height of the ball goes up the random disoriented motion of the molecules inside the ground goes down so this does not violate energy conservation so it is a fully valid process as far as energy conservation is co concerned but the point is that there is something deeper in the universe which goes beyond the first law of thermodynamics which goes beyond energy conservation so if you look at the first law of thermodynamics <coughs> the first law which is the change in the internal energy equals the microscopic work plus orderly macroscopic work plus some other forms of energy transfer this law actually tells us about a process and what does it tell us it tells us what is possible so this law is a statement which tells us what is possible in the universe and you can't do better than this you cannot automatically increase the internal energy without having some q without having some w or other forms of energy it's you cannot inflate energy like you inflate currency that is you don't have currency against the state bank but you uh, uh, bring out a large number of currency notes you cannot do this with energy so you cannot increase energy at your will so this law tells us what is possible but what about the second law of thermodynamics but first of all let me show you another video now this video is taken from one of the largest experiments that is taking place in CERN in Switzerland it's called the CMS compact muon solenoid experiment in which particles collide and when particles collide they produce a large array of new particles so let's look at a simulation of this experiment so you have two beams coming in of particles so this is the cms two beams the blue beams coming in of particles and they collide and they form a zoo of new particles a very large number of new particles and these particles tell us something about the universe tell us something about space time new particles are discovered probably the higgs boson is also discovered in this way so you smash uh, beams at very high energy the energies here are about 7 tera electron volts now this is also a process that occurs in nature under human control if i were to run this process backwards this is what you would observe so there's a large number of particles that are far apart they come together they aggregate they congregate they lump together coalesce and then form two beams two orderly beams that move away once more so in every particle collision experiment energy is conserved the before the collision the incident particles have some energy and after collision the incident particle the uh, scattered particles or the new particles that are created have some energy and the energies must match right so this is the principle of conservation of energy if you ran this experiment backwards still energy would be conserved so there is no violation of the second law of thermodynamics however why did you laugh at the first video which was the bouncing ball played in reverse why would you laugh at this video because it defies our common sense so there has to be something else in the universe some other law which describes 
something more about the universe and that law is called the second law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics as compared to the first law tells us what is probable so the first law tells us what is possible the second law tells us what is really probable right so i'm going to move to the blackboard let me move the screen back up Now how do we start understanding the second law of thermodynamics? It's a very sophisticated and a very subtle argument. But let me start with an example. Suppose you have an object that is hot, which has a higher thermal energy. You measure its temperature, you will obtain a certain temperature. You bring it in contact with a cold object. Now there is a temperature gradient and from our everyday experience we know that there will be a transfer of microscopic work which means a transfer of energy from the hot object to the cold object and this is the energy that we generally call Q. It's the energy in transit generally called heat. Now the energy transfer will cease, it will stop. Not altogether, but on average it will, you will, it will appear as if no further Q is being transferred when the two objects are at the same temperature. Right. So this is our common understanding. Now the question I would like to ask is that there is a distribution of energies in the hot object. There is a distribution of energies in the cold object. Some molecules are moving fast, some molecules are moving slow. Now why does energy, can you describe from a molecular perspective, from an atomistic perspective, why does energy f flow from the hot object to the cold object? Just describe it in simple molecular terms. So speak up. But these molecules are also vibrating here. So every molecule in the hot object is vibrating faster than every molecule in the cold object? Not necessarily. On average. But which means it is very possible. It is very possible that if this cold object on the surface, if there is a molecule that has a higher energy, be it random energy, but a higher energy so that it gives a push to the molecule in the hot side, so energy at that microscopic scale should actually transfer from the cold object to the hot object. So there is nothing really stopping us from transferring energy from the cold object to the hot object. But it defies our common sense. It defies our common knowledge. And the second law of thermodynamics actually provides an answer. In other words, it is very possible that there is a very energetic molecule. Out of the millions of molecules, there is a very energetic molecule in the cold object that comes in contact with a very slow molecule in the hot object and transfers at the molecular level its energy to the hot object. So this molecular motion can transfer from the cold object to the hot object at the molecular scale. But is this a probable event or not? This is what the second law of thermodynamics answers. It's a possible event. Yes, it's very possible that this very hot molecule in the cold object transfers its energy to the hot object. It's possible. But is it probable? That's what second law answers. 
Just imagine that if this was one molecule instead of a solid and this was one small molecule instead of a whole solid then it's difficult to talk about average energies because you're reducing the scale. This contains billions and zillions of molecules. But what if you talk with nanoparticles with only have a few molecules? So things have to be looked at in the light of statistics. And what we're going to discuss in this lecture and the next lecture is an aspect called of physics called statistical mechanics. So you've already studied mechanics, you already know about the quantization of energy. Now I'm going to bring in a little bit of statistics into the picture. So when the uh, concept of the second law of thermodynamics was being uh, built up, Einstein proposed a model. It's called the statistical model of a solid. We already have a model of a solid, a crystal, which comprises harmonic oscillators or atoms that are bonded to one another. So this is our rough model of a three-dimensional grid of atoms and any two atoms they are connected by a spring. Right? All right. And we know that each one of these acts like a harmonic oscillator. Each connection acts like a harmonic oscillator. Now this solid is placed at a certain temperature T. So there is random disorderly vibration of these atoms. All right. Now since the number of atoms is very large, each atom is independent of its neighbor. Consider this atom. It's connected to six neighboring atoms. One, two, three, four, five, six. So its coordination number is six. But all the atoms, since it's random motion, all the atoms are independent of one another. Their oscillations are independent of one another. These two springs cause motion in the z-axis. These two springs cause motion in the, say, the y-axis. These two springs cause motion in the x-axis. So what Einstein proposed is that if you have a large number of atoms and all of them are independent, then you can assume that each atom can be modeled by three oscillators, one along x, but it is connected to a fixed wall. This is the x direction. The other is connected to the y direction, uh, to a wall in the y direction. The same atom is connected to a wall in the y direction. This is the y direction. And the third possibility is that this atom is connected to the wall in the z direction. So there are two simplifications. One is that all atoms are independent. Number one. Because there is disorderly motion, you can make this assumption. It's a very valid assumption. Since it's random, each atom is behaving independently of the other. So, the atoms are independent and the other thing is that the x motion is independent of the y motion and it's independent of the z motion. 
and these walls are fixed. So this is a model of the solid. This is not the real solid, but this is just a model. And it's a very good model because the atoms are independent. Now this single atom can be represented by harmonic oscillators. How many of them? How many harmonic oscillators? Three. So this is one harmonic oscillator along the X, one along the Y, one along the Z direction. And the total energy of this system, the total energy, which is just the vibrational part of the energy, is given by a kinetic energy term and a potential energy term. The kinet potential energy term is given by half K, say X squared. The potential, the kinetic energy is given by Px squared over 2m. This is just half mv squared. But these are the two components in the x direction. There are energy components in the y direction as well. Half k y squared plus p y squared over 2m. And there are energy components in the z direction. Half k z squared plus p z squared over 2m. Right? So since these are three independent oscillators, you can factor out their energies. There is an energy associated with the x vibration. There is an energy associated with the y vibration. And there is an energy associated with the z vibration. So one atom makes up three harmonic oscillators. N atoms make up three N harmonic oscillators. Question, what about quantization? Is this energy quantized? Yes, it has to be quantized because we're talking about microscopic objects, energy is quantized. The vibrational energy is quantized. There is no rotational energy here because it's a solid. The molecules or the atoms cannot rotate. There's no vibrational energy, only rotational energy. And we know that the rotational energy is quantized. Uh, vibrational energy, sorry. Vibrational energy is quantized. This is also quantized. This is also quantized. So I can draw three harmonic oscillators representing one atom. And when we talk about their energies, the energy levels are discrete. They are quantized. Lowest energy level, first excited, second excited, and so on. So this is the ground state energy for one oscillator. For the other oscillator, there is an identical energy level diagram. And for here, it's an identical energy level diagram. And for harmonic oscillators, these energies are equally spaced. Now students have been asking the question, how would we know that the energy levels are spaced equally or they go further apart? For that, we have to solve the Schrodinger equation. We don't know that as yet. So don't worry, I'll provide you, I'll, I'm, I'm telling you that the energy levels are quantized. We we'll learn later how to find these energy levels. So one atom is represented by three oscillators. Now this minimum energy in each oscillator is E0. This is of course not zero because there is ground state energy. Now suppose we have some amount of energy with the atom. Some amount of energy in joules or electron volts. And we would like to see how this energy is distributed among the oscillators. Now let's define some units of energy and the units that I'm going to talk about, let's call them quantums. Suppose we have four quantums of energy or quanta of energy. Hamare paas char quantums hai energy ke. Agar Yevely state populated hogi, we say that this is zero quantum of energy. 
अगर ये वाली स्टेट पॉपुलेटेड होगी वी से इट्स वन क्वांटम ऑफ एनर्जी टू क्वांटम्स ऑफ एनर्जी थ्री क्वांटम्स ऑफ एनर्जी फोर क्वांटम्स ऑफ एनर्जी सो इफ वी हैव फोर क्वांटम्स ऑफ एनर्जी व्हिच इज द टोटल एनर्जी ऑफ द एटम एंड वी वुड लाइक टू डिस्ट्रीब्यूट दिस एनर्जी इनटू द थ्री हार्मोनिक ऑसिलेटर्स देयर आर डिफरेंट पॉसिबिलिटीज वन पॉसिबिलिटी इज वन टू थ्री फोर इज that this oscillator carries all the four quantums of energy and the other two oscillators carry none zero quantum zero quantum all right this is one possibility one oscillator has four quantums the other two x oscillator has four quantum so it's vibrating in the x direction and not vibrating in the y direction or just has a zero point energy in the y and the z directions one possibility but there are other possibilities too for example let's call this configuration 4 0 0 so this is one configuration and i make it compact i write this as 4 0 0 so this is a distribution of energy given you have four quantums of energy the total energy is given provided and you want to distribute the energy into the quantized harmonic oscillators the other possibility is you have 0 4 0 and then there's another possibility you have 0 0 4 so let me draw these uh, oscillators for you just once so that you understand what's going on we've already drawn the possibility for 400 so you can have this possibility this is 040 you could also have this possibility <coughs> this is 004 0 the ground state is populated here the ground state is populated here and all the four quantums are with this oscillator possibly the z oscillator so we have drawn four arrangements but there are other possibilities g zero quantums means just the ground state energy okay <laughs> zero quantums means the ground state energy because we say that the principal quantum number n is zero but we really don't have zero energy zero quantum means the ground state energy <laughs> There is zero point energy, and the extra is four quantums. All right, so there are these three possibilities. But are there more possibilities? Yes, indeed, they are. We have. Can you enumerate those possibilities? Three one zero. Three zero one. One three zero. One zero three. Two, one, two, one, one. Three one zero three zero one three zero one zero three. सही तो लिखा था आर देर एनी अदर पॉसिबिलिटीज Is that all? 
राइट हाउ मेनी आर दे तीन चार पाँच छ सात आठ नौ दस ग्यारह बारह तेरह चौदह पंद्रह सो दीज आर फिफ्टीन पॉसिबिलिटीज All right so please listen carefully now <clears throat> we call these 15 possibilities in the language of statistical mechanics as 15 micro states and this condition that there are four quantums of energy we call this condition as the macro state so the macro state of this single atom is that it carries four quantums of energy and there are 15 micro states possible 15 possible micro states all right so there are 15 possible ways in which this energy can be distributed corresponding to one macro state there are 15 micro states and each one of these micro states has the same probability this is a fundamental premise of statistical mechanics all the micro states have equal probability so if i would to draw a graph between the micro states and the probability of the micro state given a particular macro state what would i get i would get 15 bars of equal height it's a discrete probability distribution and these micro states are just these 15 states i can number them in any way i like this is 004 this is 040 400 and so on and what's the probability of each one of these micro states 1 over 15 so this height is 1 over 15 all right so everything is very simple we know what a macro state is we know what a micro state is now let's move on to a slightly more complicated example in which two atoms are brought close to one another so how many oscillators do we have 6 3 with the first one 3 with the second one this is atom number 1 this is atom number 2 and they are identical atoms so the oscillators are also identical the spacings between the levels are perfectly identical <coughs> now again i define a macro state the macro state is that both of these atoms have a total energy of four quantums all right now i would like to find out the micro states so the macro state is still the same four quantums of energy that are distributed amongst these six oscillators now if the problem is simplified if i start making a table Now we 
have four quantums in total. We have to distribute the energies. So all four quantums can go to atom A. All four of them can go to atom B. So just consider the physical problem. We have one atom that has four quantums of energy and another atom that is at the ground state. So we have two atoms with different energies and we bring them close together so that they start interacting. There's the possibility of transfer of energy. So there's a possibility of Q. And what we would like to find out what happens after equilibrium has been established. All right, so this is related to the original question I asked of what happens when a hot object meets a cold object. So now we have one atom with four quantums of energy, the other atom has none to start off with. Then they are brought close to one another. Now those four quanta of energy have to be distributed amongst the four atoms. So one possibility is that atom A has all the four quantums and atom B has none. One possibility is that atom A has none after equilibrium has been established and B has four. So I call this case one, I call this case two. The other possibility is that three quantums go to atom one and three go to, one goes to B, one, three. I call these cases three and four. But there are more possibilities and th there's a possibility that two quantums go to atom A and two quantums go to atom B. So there are five possibilities in total. Can you think of any more? No, these are the only ones. Now we draw another table which has the number of microstates okay you have to I'll give you half a minute to think how many microstates are associated with this case number one 15 because 15 times 1 there's only one way in which one of the atoms can have zero energy right this becomes 15 this becomes 15 does everyone understand this no all oh, right so how many ways are there to arrange four quantums in one atom kisne kaha tha no ah kitne tarike hain four quantums ko arrange karne ke ek atom ke andar wahan dekho 15. There are 15 ways in which four quantums can be arranged in one atom. And how many ways are there in which zero quantums can be arranged in one atom? There's only one way. And that one way is is in the second atom zero quantums with this oscillator zero quantums with this oscillator zero quantums with this oscillator there's only one way so I put 15 times 1 here I put 1 times 15 now uh, what I would like to know is could you just work out uh, the number of microstates associated with case number 3 just work it out Eighteen. I'm writing something here because I don't want to show this to you.
Anyone? 30? 27? It's 31? 21? No, no, no. Let's work this out. Let's work this out. So there are, please be attentive. There are three quantums in atom number one. So I draw three oscillators. And I want to distribute three quantums. One possibility is all three go here, zero, zero. Right? This is one possibility. So I call this 300. Zero, zero. But I can also have 030. Zero, zero. I can also have 003. Zero, zero, one possibility is that I have two here, one here, and zero here. 2, Are there any other possibilities? Yes. There is possibility of 1, 1, 1. Any more? No. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 possibilities of arranging three quantums in the first atom. So I have 10 multiplied by something. <laughs> so one quantum has to be put into three oscillators. There are three ways for doing that. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. So 10 is multiplied by 3 to give 30. So there are 30 microstates in which there are three quantums in the first atom, one quantum in the second atom. Iske saath kya hoga? 30. It's 3 times 10. Now what about this configuration? 36. 6 by 6. You want to work this out on your own. Alright. So this brings us to a very nice and a very illuminating juncture. Here, you guys are doing a lot of things in my opinion. I have studied many classes before, many of you have This is a very talkative class. Sorry to say. So now we have these, uh, how many total number of microstates are associated with the one macrostate? 126. One macrostate 126 microstates. The macrostate is there are two atoms with four quantums of energy and those can be distributed in 126 different ways. Okay? Now what I could do in fact is I could plot a graph between the number of quantums in atom A versus the number of microstates could you ma please make this plot for me it's going to be a discrete distribution don't make a continuous graph make a discrete graph Bars, no discrete graph, no. So 
देख के वो टेबल आपके सामने है उसको देख के बस ग्राफ बनाना ठीक है सर टू है टू थ्री ठीक है शाम ठीक है so there could be zero atoms in in uh, quantum in the first atom they could be one they could be two they could be three they could be four so with zero and four i have 15 microstates so zero quantums in the first atom 15 microstates are possible total you see the microstates the total number of microstates is 126 for this combined system of two atoms what i am plotting is be attentive what i am plotting is the number of microstates versus the number of quantums in atom in the first atom it's not it's not one it's we have 15 microstates of this composite system comprising two atoms in which there could be zero quantums in the first atom this is also goes up to 15 now this number is 30 This number is also thirty. <laughs> And the highest probability is for atom A having two quantums, which means atom B will ha also have two quantums. This is thirty-six. It goes further up a little bit. It goes further up. It goes up to thirty-six. <laughs> All right. So, what do we learn from this? What we learn from this is, then we, when we started our process, one atom had four quantums. So initially. atom a had four quantums all the four quantums and the number of microstates associated with it was 15 and the second atom had no quantum at all so there was only one microstate 0 0 of having no quantum at all so if you look at atom b 0 1 2 3 if you look at this how many quantums does it have initially 0 so only this microstate exists and how many microstates just one because for atom b is now separate from atom a there is only one microstate possible 0 0 microstate so there is a one microstate associated with atom a and atom b so what's the probability that in atom a there are four quantums it's 100% and what's the probability that in atom b there is zero quantums 
it's 100 percent there's no other peak in this graph now when the two atoms combine and they start interacting with one another what happens is a new distribution is formed after equilibrium has been established and we observe that the highest probability goes to what to an equal distribution of the four quantums between the two atoms initially the first atom had all the four quantums but after equilibrium has been established and a certain amount of time is allowed to progress the quantums are equally distributed so the highest probability is for the, these quantums to be equally distributed amongst the two atoms and this probability is 36 divided by 126 and the probability that the quantums are shared in the ratio 1 to 3 or 3 to 1 is 50, this is 30 over 126 this is 30 over 126 so it's 60 over 126 right probability that it's stored uh, saved in the ratio 1 to 3 is 30 over 126 so this is how we will analyze the problem the highest probability is when the two atoms share two quantums each the next lower is that when one of the atoms shares three the other atom shares one one of the atom shares one the other atom shares three and there is a small probability that all the quantums reside on just one of the atoms so what equilibration does it tries to distribute the energy in a more equitable fashion equitable ka matlab barabari ki sata par barabar wo share karna chahta hai atoms ke darmiyan theek hai to this is a law of nature we are already sensing that what the second law of thermodynamics is if we have some energy some macro state and we would like to find the distributions now just <coughs> i want to turn this on Now what we've seen here, the last 15 minutes, so be attentive. What we've seen here is two atoms interacting. Now these atoms are small objects. Bhoot kam hoga laboratory ke andar ya real life mein jab aapka pala atom se padega. Aapka atom se pala to nahi padta. Aapka to solid se pala padta hai. Ya liquid se pala padta hai. Jis mein there are 10 raised power 20 atoms, 10 raised power 30 atoms. 10 raised power 25 atoms and so on so we generally encounter macroscopic objects excuse me the two of you what's your roll number kya roll number hai aapka patao roll number patao apne card do Question so far? G. If the number of quantums in atom A are zero, can you please draw and tell us how that when, when there are zero quantums in atom A, how can it have the two microstates? Can you move the atom B to So when atom all right, the question is when atom A has zero quantums, atom B has four quantums. So the fifteen microstates come from atom four having all the four quantums. So what we are plotting is the number of microstates versus the number of quantums in atom A. But there are actually two atoms. So if atom A has no quantum, all the 15 quantums go to atom B. Oh, sorry, all the four quantums go to atom B and there are 15 microstates associated with it. Okay? You plot this to understand this. Yes. I just the number of microstates that you are plotting are from both A and B. So if I plot in this particular case, if I plotted number of quantums in atom B, it's going to be the same graph. But that is not always the case. 
All right. So now we're dealing with two atoms, but really we have a. I'll answer your question in a minute. But really we have a large number of atoms. Suppose we have this original example of a hot object coming in contact with a cold object. Now suppose we have to add objects, larger objects that are coming close to one another. For example, we have an object that has 100 atoms. It's still not a very large object from our microscopic perspective, but larger than the example that we've seen. And we have an object with 50 atoms. And the total number of quantums that we have, suppose, is 100 quantums. So the macro state is that we have two objects, one of 100 atoms, the other of 50 atoms, and there are 100 quantums of energy that have to be distributed amongst these objects. Now, if we would like to do a graphical procedure as we've done with two atoms, we'll quickly run into trouble. So what we really want to do is we would like to devise a formula that can give us these quantums. And the formula is very simple. You'll have to remember it, I'm afraid. And you'll remember it by practice. And it can be derived. People who studied permutations and combinations, it's very easy for them. And I've uploaded some reference material that can help you understand where this formula comes from. But the formula goes as follows. The number of microstates with n oscillators and q quantums of energy. In those n oscillators is denoted by capital Omega depends on n and Q and is given by n plus Q minus 1 factorial divided by Q factorial divided by n minus 1 factorial does everyone know what factorial is? Yes. Anyone who doesn't know what factorial is? All right. So this is the number of microstates. So let's see if this formula works for our case. When we have four quantums in one atom, how many oscillators do we have? Three. So four quantums in one atom n is 3 because there's one atom there are three oscillators q is 4 the number of microstates is given by 3 plus 4 minus 1 6 factorial divided by 4 factorial divided by 2 factorial and this is 30 divided by 2, which is 15. Right? So there are 15 ways of putting four quantums into one atom. This one also comes out from the formula. How many ways do we have of putting into three oscillators zero quantums? 2 factorial, 0 factorial, 2 factorial, 0 factorial is 1, this turns out to be 1. So this is the formula 
for calculating the number of microstates given the number of quantums and the number of oscillators. So now let's look at this example. We have 100 atoms coming close together to 50 atoms. Let me finish please. Coming close together to 50 atoms and the energy, total energy is 100 quantums. So we would have to make, write a computer program that actually calculates the number of microstates. And I've written such a program, it's very simple, all of you have done MATLAB and I'll show you the outcome of this program. The answer. Has everyone done MATLAB? Yes. yes. So everything will be very intuitive for you. All right. Let me just increase the font size. So, two objects. The first object has 100 atoms. How many oscillators? 300. For, here is the number of oscillators in the first atom. 300. The second object just has a mere 50 atoms. So, these are not really macroscopic objects as yet. These are very small nano particles. 50 atoms means 150 oscillators and I have 100 quantums of energy. So those 100 quantums of energy have to be distributed in this combined system. Initially all those 100 quantums could be on one object. Now you're bringing the two objects closer together. Now I would just count the number of microstates for the first object. I use this formula, this one that I've written here, this one. This is uh, n choose k, it's a combination. This is something which just implements this formula. So, and the output is an array in which the first object is, if there are zero quantums in the first object, what's the number of microstates? The second object is, if the second element is if there are one quantum in the first object, how many microstates do we have and so on. Then I do repeat the same procedure for the second object. Then I make different kinds of plots. So this is the final result. I've just done a simulation. Instead of making the table on a blackboard, which would take me probably the life of the universe to do it. Because the numbers that are coming out, they are exponents of with a factor of hundreds. And no calculator can do this for me, I think. You need a very sophisticated calculator or a computer to do these calculations for you. So what I have here is the number of microstates 
for the object A when there are this number of objects in A the number of so this x axis is just the same as this axis number of quantums in atom A this x axis number of atoms in number of quantums in atom A and this is plotting the number of microstates only in A so it's just plotting this particular uh, so there are four atoms in A which means there are 15 microstates there are zero atoms in A there is one microstate so if you look at just the number of microstates in A associated with A it has the highest number when all the quantums are in one of the atoms so this is what is shown here if all the hundred quantums are in atom A then the number of microstates associated with just with A is very large it's 10 is part 96 <coughs> so the all right likewise if I plot the number of microstates in B and plot it versus the same x-axis the number of quantums in A I would obtain a very strong peak 10 is part 71 when there are no quantums in state A which means all the quantums are in atom B so zero quantums in A means all the quantums are in B now this last curve to compute the number of microstates associated with four quantums being in A and zero quantums being in B I have to multiply the number of microstates associated with A with the number of microstates associated with B and if I perform this multiplication this is what I get so this curve is the same as this curve now observe this curve this curve has a very sharp peak and the value of the peak the number of microstates is 10 raised to power 110 this is larger than the number of particles in the universe this is much larger than the age of the universe in seconds so this is a very large number which means that the, the probability this probability has to be very high and all other probabilities have to be exceedingly small this number is very close to zero or hundreds of orders of magnitude smaller to the peak here so even though there is a probability distribution the most likely point at which this distribution curve peaks is the most likely the most probable Q is actually the only probable Q and if you calculate if you find out where this Q occurs it's occurring at about 67 which means that there are 60 the equilibrium state is such that there are 67 atoms in object a, uh, quantums in object A and there are the remaining 33 in object B and this is also the same ratio as the ratio of the number of atoms these atoms are 100 over 150 which means two-thirds of the atoms in this combined system are in object A one-third of the atoms are in object B which means two-thirds of the total number of quantums 67 are in object A that, that is where the probability distribution is peaking so this probability distribution tells us that even though there is some probability here some probability here some probability here but it's minuscule it's exceedingly small as compared to the probability that we see at the peak so it is virtually practically impossible to achieve any other uh, microstate distribution any other energy distribution but the most probable distribution which means the most probable distribution becomes the only 
it becomes very close to the only possible scenario that you will observe in your real life. The last point is that since these exponents are very large, one would like to make the, take the natural log of these objects. So if I take the natural log of these objects, this curve appears like this, this curve appears like this, and this curve appears like this. So this object is called the entropy. And we see that the entropy is maximized at a certain point. And we will continue from here. This is what the second law of thermodynamics actually states. So see you on Thursday.